welcome to episode three of Looking at Picture Books, which is all about non-fiction. And my special guest is illustrator Jenny Desmond, who's going to talk about her new book, Fourteen Wolves. But first of all, I'm just going to show you a couple of other examples of non-fiction books. I'm going to start by looking at an old favourite, Why Frogs Are Wet by Judy Hawes and Don Madden. This was actually first published in 1968 and it's part of a wonderful series called Let's Read and Find Out. The illustrations in this book are so characterful. It's a lovely example of how to make realistic animal drawings into characters without losing any of the scientific accuracies. It's very very playful. It alternates black and white with colour spreads but the colour spreads are just two colours, the yellow and the blue, combining to make green in places. particularly like all the vegetation in this book and I love this picture of the frog shedding its skin and then eating it. And there's the tadpole developing into a frog. Beautiful framing here on this one. Next I'm going to look at So You Want to Be an Owl, which is actually written by me and illustrated by Maddie Frost. Um, but I wanted to include it in this non-fiction episode because I think Maddie has done such a lovely job of creating a very, very playful feeling illustrations that are still factual. So we've got our owl character, Professor Olaf. But when it comes to real owls, like the elf owl, they are realistic, but still very appealing. So Maddie's had a lot of fun creating the disguise there for Professor Olaf. There's lots of information in here, but it's presented so that it's not overwhelming. particularly like this page with all the different types of owl making their sounds. I think that's my favourite illustration in the whole book. And now for 14 Wolves, written by Catherine Barr and illustrated by Jenny Desmond. It's a story about rewilding and the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone Park and how that affected the whole landscape. Beautiful end papers here, which are echoed at the end of the book by the wolves' footprints as they are introduced. The illustrations are just sumptuous all the way through and Jenny has planned it so there is a huge amount of variety. I particularly like this page with the dog sleds with their lamps on. Isn't this just stunning? And this cross section showing where the beavers live and talking about the impact that they have on the landscape. And then this page shows you the meanders of the river and then when you turn over those exact meanders are echoed in the shape of the road. There's lots of clever details like that in this book.
Hi, Jenny. James, so nice to see you. Lovely to see you <laughs> too. And thank you for joining me on episode three of Looking at Picture Books to oh, talk about you. your wonderful new book, 14 Wolves. <laughs> I've just been really enjoying looking at all the wonderful details in it and the textures and everything. I'm very excited about finding out about mm -hmm. the techniques that went into making it. Do you want to start by telling me a bit about the planning process because it's twice as long as the average picture book so that must have been quite a headache getting everything sorted out. It, yeah it's huge and there was so much research to do initially as well because um, I don't really know anything about wolves so um, I think to do non-fiction you really have to know your subject so I have to become sort of a proper wolf fan so I did lots of reading of people's biography, like anything I could find. I just read loads and loads of things about people uh, exploring Yellowstone or kind of having obsessions with wolves. And so once once I'd read lots of things like that, I, I had in my mind what a wolf did, how it moved. So then I could then I could plan it, I think, a bit better. I think all of that really comes out in the book. You oh, thank you. You really know and love your wolves. And what <laughs> I particularly like, actually, just this page at the end, each wolf is really, really different. Well, I was, I was given a book by um, the publishers, Bloomsbury, and it had most of the pictures of, the, of those initial animal, uh, the initial wolves in it. Yeah, I wanted to give each one a, a bit of a personality. And, and also it was actually 15 wolves and one of them died before it um, reached Yellowstone. And we were going to just leave that one out. And I felt quite strongly that it was important to um, put that one in as well. Yes. So I did I did that one in an outline instead of um, coloured in as a sort of wolf in heaven. I don't know. <laughs> so when when I was planning, I do I do lots of um, thumbnails initially. Um, so lots of little boxes with scribbles of different compositions in it, because I think it's the composition that's quite a difficult thing to get right initially. And I think really dynamic composition is really important, um, yeah. especially in, in non-fiction. Um, it's quite important for me for non-fiction not to be boring or too many charts and labels and things because um, when I was young, I wasn't really into non-fiction um, and I, I liked a narrative and a story and I liked my imagination to be sparked, but I don't see why that can't be the case with non-fiction as well, just because it's a true story doesn't mean that it has to be very straight. And One of your roughs that I think must have been an early rough that didn't make it in, you'd, it's a, like an overhead view of the trucks moving and it was in the shape, the profile of a wolf's head. I really liked doing that. So this, actually I've got it here. So yeah. it was gonna, it was going to connect up like a wolf so That's that they were travelling up the, the back. Together, yeah. <laughs> it's a lovely idea and then kind of going over the mountains which was the ear and then this I do this a lot I I have lots of different um lots of different ideas that don't always make it in because even though I love the idea of of that actually when the reader's reading it they probably don't always get all these things that I'm slipping in and yeah. perhaps it didn't enhance the composition or the story so sometimes you have to let go of these ideas that you really enjoy <laughs> doing. Well, isn't it? I, I, so <laughs> sometimes cool. ideas are just too clever for their own good. <laughs> um, I had some really great editors at Bloomsbury, um, uh, Isabel and Saskia and uh, the three designers, uh, Katie was the last one, but, but quite often they'll be like, yeah, no. <laughs> I'm like, that's the best, that's the best spread, the whole book. I'm like, doesn't really work. <laughs> so anyway. That was one of those. And so quite often when I'm doing the, the thumbnails, I'll do possibly quite a few options, maybe five or six options for each one, really just brainstorm. I think, I think you're meant to do sort of 20 ideas in 20 minutes. I never get to 20, I'll probably get to five. Um, but just brainstorming lots of different ideas of how the composition could look and how the narrative goes. And then I normally choose one, one composition and I'll put it in another set of thumbnails and see how each one works together because it's really, it's a whole. So you're not really looking at each spread and visually you're looking at it as a, as a picture book and as a complete work. And then once I get 
once I've done that, then I work it up and make lots of roughs. So there's a rough of the, the mother yeah. with the cubs. Yeah. And I spend quite a lot of time working out where I want the text to go. And sometimes I'll go like this, this one again. I wanted the text to go like that. Yes. Across, <laughs> and I think that got vetoed as well. Um, Just to, while I remember speaking of the text, is that font your handwriting? It is. I knew it. <laughs> it was really, it looks really good. It is. Um, Thank you. Can we talk about the, the actual artwork? Because um, you've sent through a beautiful image of the wolf, the stages of making the wolf. This one, I, I painted quite a dark background initially and then painted um, the shape of the wolf. I used photo references for this one, but I normally use maybe five or six different photo references. Yeah. Um, of different walls and different expressions and then I'll sort of put them all up on the computer screen and make my own versions. That's from really them. clever because otherwise the danger if you just use one is that it looks really stiff and lifeless doesn't it? Yeah and then yeah I painted the, I painted the light shades and then and then did it with, with acrylic and then the greys and then with um, ink and pencil crayon I started working in all the details of the face Actually, I'm, I'm really not a patient person. It maybe looks like I am, but oh, <laughs> it's like, like ah, oh, wolf hair. And then I, I did it in pencil, and then I use a little rubber, like a really thin, like this, to then take away the pencil. Oh yes, yeah, a rubber that's um, like a pen. Thin mm. rubber, so then you can you can have the white hairs coming through as well. Oh, so it's the dark pencil tip. hairs and the white rubber hairs. Yeah. And then just slowly um, develop it up. But I think one of the reasons I also sent it to you because um, when I was thinking about making this wolf, I wanted it to look quite anxious and sad. Like this wolf, wolf had been cap like um, captured from Canada mm. and put in a box and an aeroplane and and taken. And I, I really felt sorry for it. I wanted this wolf to really like reflect that. Yeah, that's um, so interesting that you put that emotion into a non-fiction book which you might think there's no place for it but actually it works really well and it connects you to the story so powerful. I can't help, my, I can't help myself. <laughs> no you shouldn't help yourself. <laughs> I'll put more says everything. Um, by the time I finished it though it looked too worried and anxious I was like actually that's not what I'm trying to say like I don't want it to look worried like this is a wild animal. Um, by the time I, I finished it by hand um, and then I scanned it in and um, I changed the expression quite a bit to to be sort of less worried and actually more slightly more fierce and a bit more um and just looking at the reader and making the yeah. re hopefully making the reader think yes um a bit more about what the wolf is thinking yeah and to make it look a bit more determined um, um, um so would you like to talk <clears throat> a bit about your favorite materials yes so the rubber <laughs> yes talked about um Actually, Photoshop is, I, I always felt like Photoshop was cheating, but I think actually I do a lot of work by hand, but then I scan it in and I make it, I try and make it better in Photoshop. So I find Photoshop a really good tool. And I used to think it was cheating if I didn't have all of the original art perfectly it's finished. It's cheating. <laughs> well, I've worked out, it's not cheating, is it? And um, it just, it's about just making the best work you can. So. I'll try and make it the best, but I can be a little more free if I'm um, making something um, by hand and not worrying too much if I make a mistake, because then I can just edit it and Photoshop. Exactly <laughs> I might do like three versions of something and then stitch the nose of that one and the eye of that one together. Yeah, so it's um, like the editing so highlights. I never highlights. my originals because they're just like a big pile of terrible painting <laughs> and drawings. That I've not started. cheating at all. <laughs> I think that's how you said German brand uh, watercolor, really amazing pigments. They're really expensive, but um, I found them the best watercolors that I found. Different size brushes. I think I've got a photo here of those. Um, I really like the Winsor Newton Series Seven. Yeah, number two. I think that's a, a cult paintbrush. <laughs> Mechanical pencil, really great. You can like sharpen it really, so you can get so for the hairs of the wolf, you can get it really, really sharp and thin. And then I often have that 2B and then I'll use 4B for um, rough sketching. Yeah. 
uh, Karen Dash and Faber Castell coloring pencils. But I just like, I think it's really important to have a really good pigment. Um, yeah. When I'm doing coloring with my daughter and there's sometimes like crayons that where the pigment isn't good, like you really, you just can't do, oh, it's horrible, That's isn't it? That's the worst thing oh. when people give children those terrible pencils. Oh. They break all the time as well. Oh, I know. And sort of, you get like a hundred. Better off having three really good ones than one of those yeah. packs of a hundred. And I really don't have that many pencil crayons actually because I'm so particular about colour. I actually don't even want the horrible colours in my studio. Um, and then acrylic and gouache, I use um, ink and um, <clears throat> and washi tape because when I'm when I'm doing the roughs, I'll I'll then stick them on my wall in rows to look at the pacing. So washi yeah. tape kind of doesn't take all the paint off. Yeah. One thing I was going to ask about that, I noticed the magic word somewhere that you, in something you sent through, printmaking, because I know in the bear you did a little bit of etching and scanned in some etched lines. Uh, yeah, in the polar bear. Uh, the polar bear, I mean. Yeah, yeah. I just wondered, had any little elements of printmaking <laughs> snuck their way in? What I love about printmaking is the textures again. So I'll use dry points, which is like, um, piece of metal and scratching textures and making different marks into the um, plate and it, it encourages like spontaneity I think in your work because you don't really know how it's going to come out when it's so you've got to let go of like, oh, that's quite a fun little like sketchy bit and I think when I was doing the polar bear especially for the ice and snow it was really because there wasn't there was a lot of white I think then having really interesting textures in Printmaking was it's more important when the colours really really good and uh, this this one the snow is uh, from a dry point it's just a tech lots of like it's just very subtle texture but it um or quite often I'll go to print studio and scan in loads of different textures and then I can just put them into the background in Photoshop when I was looking <clears> through there was one page that really reminded me of Albert's tree I, was, <laughs> I got out Albert's tree and I was thinking <laughs> this is like you can see the origins of 14 wolves almost <laughs> in this book the landscapes and I did wonder whether the people who commissioned 14 wolves had seen this and thought ah oh, yeah it hadn't occurred to me that they were similar I think I think once you get really keen on like certain landscapes and colors and tree like maybe things repeat in books without you realizing it so um the themes I, resurface don't they yeah at the time and like, I love mountains and I love like trees and so I probably put similar theme I love snow yeah I love, like just huge landscapes so I probably often put them into different books because that's what I like doing that's what I'm interested in so Jenny do you prefer doing non-fiction or stories um Oh, it's hard. I, I, my ideal situation is to do a fiction, then a non-fiction, then a fiction, then a non-fiction. I think with fiction, you can be so much more free um, because you don't have to be accurate to the animal or to the landscape. Mm. And you can have sort of quite a lot of fun with it and just go for, all from your imagination. Whereas non-fiction, you do have to be a little bit mindful of being quite accurate. Sometimes it's kind of reassuring and comforting to have that structure of having to tie it to real life it get, those constraints can be quite creative sometimes yeah yeah I, I think so and actually it, yeah it's really it's really nice having someone else writing it a book for me as well rather than yeah me writing it because you are you are in in that in those confines and then you can like yeah. push the boundaries whereas helpful. if you are the boundaries yes like there's no there's no wall and then you sort of you make oh, every single this. decision and sometimes it's too much isn't it it's too much and then you just go and anything. but I think with um with non-fiction I really I really like doing something that feels really meaningful hmm. um and I'm really passionate about like the environment climate change nature and it feels like my way of being able to do something and See, it's lovely to think that a child will read that book and then become an ecologist or something in the future. I mean, I say a child, probably loads, but you know, you will influence a new generation. Well, who knows, but what people. an amazing thought, like hopefully inspire, if I could just inspire one child to love nature a little bit more or find out a little bit more about 
rewilding rather than it by nature just well I, I think it, it's pitched perfectly and, and the writing of course is is great as well but it's oh, um, Catherine Barr's wonderful writer it, yeah, she did it's just very thing. engaging on informative and engaging and beautiful and you can't ask for more than that in a non-fiction book <laughs> thank you very much Jenny that's been really really fascinating learning about the process behind 14 wolves and um, I wish you the best of luck with it Thank you, Jane. Thanks right. so much for having me. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. I'm going to end with a quote from my Morris Sendak book, Caldecott and Company. And it's particularly appropriate today because Jenny was lucky enough a few years ago to be offered a Morris Sendak fellowship. Another thing that um, I was talking about with Jenny was experimenting with style. And we both agreed that it's actually nice not to pin yourself down too much. And this quote from Morris Sendak says exactly the same thing. Each book demands an individual stylistic approach. If you have only one style, then you're going to do the same book over and over, which is, of course, pretty dull. Lots of styles permit you to walk in and out of books. So my point is to have a fine style, a fat style, a fairly slim style and a really rough style. I'll see you next time on Looking at Picture Books. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.